and the good morning United States. Very nice. The second session uh, with our two universities, Oregon and the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Uh, exciting uh, uh, program for tonight with uh, our uh, special guest, our uh, David Passmore from DCU, uh, Dublin City University. A special welcome also to Whitney and Catalina, uh, who are joining our program also for the beginning. Um, for now, uh, my name is Thomas, not Bartle. Uh, it should be in my subtitle. Uh, I didn't transform. Uh, I just uh, took the different uh, different uh, stool, different seat in the room, uh, and I take over for tonight uh, instead of Bartle. You uh, will be back uh, with us at the end of the evening, uh, introducing uh, some uh, group work uh, for the paper that we're gonna produce this week. Uh, for today, and also a little bit looking back on what happened yesterday evening with Ricardo Ford, I just warm you up, and uh, I'm gonna. Uh, share my screen with you for the program. Uh, let me see. Um, I am screening. Yeah, there, we are. Uh, there we are. The program for um, this session, uh, we'll start now with a welcome and introduction of David. Uh, and uh, then um, David will hit it uh, right away at uh, 6.10 uh, uh, for a full hour with two breakout sessions uh, and he will uh, uh, immediately smack into your face after five minutes with some confronting uh, questions about high performance, of course. Then we'll end with a free uh, Q&A. Uh, you prepared some very nice questions. I will do a lead up based on a couple of suggestions that you uh, made. And uh, at the end, we'll, uh, we'll be going back into our work groups to discuss uh, our assignment of uh, this week and uh, Bartol will lead you. Um, I give you some personal impressions about last night. Of course, I've been doing my own part of critical thinking as well about Ricardo. I think he had a great, great, impressive uh, contribution to our program. Uh, but of course, uh, he made an impact on me uh, with a couple of remarks that I take into consideration uh, to sort of like concept up this whole idea of this week. Um, for instance, Whitney also mentioned this, the informal and formal impact of sports on society. Uh, can we be leading society into a positive future? Yeah, because we can use it as a tool, maybe. But also, um, values systems, they vary. Um, uh, locally, uh, per nation, eventually also per culture. So um, do we need ownership from clubs? Uh, because that was the subject. Do these ownership uh, need their own value system or should it match also the value system of a club culture? Big question for me. Uh, I think so. I think it is necessary to make it work on the long term, a, a sustainable uh, solution. And should leadership have a value system itself? Because the club is not being led by ownership, uh, but uh, usually by the uh, technical directors and management. And um, um, what I liked a lot and what I understand from his perspective, and this is very nice about this week, because this week is about the different angles, all the different perspectives that we're going to show and share with you. But his neutral opinion towards value systems, I understand, because Coca-Cola tries to strategically position itself into a neutral realm. They have to, because they're selling their beverages to the whole world. And um, uh, regarding this different belief system and value system, they should probably take a stand into a neutral area. Uh, and can they, in that case, sponsor a club? Probably very complicated yeah, with their positioning as marketeers, of course. Eh? Today we have a different uh, uh, angle uh, because um, like with Ricardo, you can see that his angle is from corporate to Olympic Federation. That's a real, like a global uh, approach. Uh, so not local like federations or commercial sport clubs could be very local, uh, but it's Olympic. It's a global planetary uh, influence. Uh, so you need to be neutral here. Otherwise it will be uh, complicated, uh, impacting the athlete team. 
there's a different perspective today because now we're looking uh, uh, more or less from the, the ground level, uh, the, the coaching level and the federation level. So uh, a, a more locally based uh, influence system. Um, the storyline more or less is that uh, we uh, have uh, these five uh, special guests and uh, um, we will focus today on the athlete team level management with David. Um, David uh, has been uh, lecturing uh, coaching and science and uh, physical education at the Dublin City University. And uh, what is very nice, he has a very rich background uh, uh, of uh, practical knowledge as a coach uh, at the, the very top level. But what I like a lot about him is uh, he also understands the, the root level of uh, sports. And um, uh, both high performance director as well as uh, a person who is specialized in the uh, root uh, development of the game. He's the, of course, he's from high performance with British hockey. Uh, I think the British, British national men's team. I'm not sure, but um, I think so. And um, uh, he went with the British women to the Sydney Olympics. Uh, Irish national men's team, high performance director of Ireland. Well, he did the whole uh, charade um, of uh, high performance experiences. And now he's consultant educator uh, I met him as an FIH, a World Hockey Federation educator, for the first time in my life. And I was impressed by his fantastic uh, knowledge uh, of the field of sport. Uh, today, uh, he will act in the role of head coach of the under 23, 25 ladies team of Ireland and assistant coach of the national team of Ireland. Uh, and he will uh, introduce you in two different uh, uh, perspectives, angles. Uh, and they actually followed uh, two different types of strategies and we're going to compare them. Um, so to wrap it up, um, uh, if you look at the strategy governance and policy production in his uh, uh, environment, um, the program that he runs is basically uh, a government funded uh, program, but he will also bring up the idea of a self-funded philanthropic uh, program. Uh, impacting uh, in two different areas, actually, the self-funded immediately to team and athlete and the government funding, of course, through federation or maybe immediately is Ireland, uh, Ireland Institute to the athlete and team. So it's a different angle if we compare that to yesterday. Um, the sports ecosystem, what we will be discussing is not like yeah, a little bit our world, but it's really about that the leadership of the coaching and technical staff in sports uh, regarding their own teams, two teams, uh, immediately impacting on the environment of the athletes and uh, more or less more on the distance, the stakeholders. Um, for now, um, what will be the key message? Uh, well, where will we concentrate upon today is the policy approach to the COVID lockdown, of course. How did they manage around this subject? Uh, the senior women's field hockey team has been uh, used as, um, uh, as, a, as a topic. Uh, they uh, qualified for Tokyo Olympic Games and they're funded through Sport Ireland High Performance Institute. And um, uh, also we will uh, have a look at the junior women's field hockey team, the ones who are uh, privately being funded uh, their program. Um, this will allow us, of course, for a comparison of how a national organization dealt with the crisis with the teams under the species of uh, compared to diff two different organizations. And um, well, I think uh, we should sort of like um, give it a hit, uh, David. Uh, we might, I don't, I'm not sure whether we'll be able to, to touch base with the, the local uh, uh, example of the domestic season, but for sure we will uh, have a close look at the senior women's field hockey team and the junior field hockey team and compare their policies and developments. Um, oh, that's one slide too far. Uh, David, um, I would like to give the show, show to you uh, and stop uh, sharing my screen and uh, ask you to uh, be part of our uh, program with our lovely students. Welcome, David. Thanks very much, Thomas, and thanks for your kind introduction. Um, I, I must admit, when, when Thomas told me who you had as your presenter yesterday, I was uh, probably a little bit nervous about uh, 
following David, up after, David, uh, can I ask you to go in? Pre yeah, that's great. Presentation. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so I was probably a little bit nervous, but um, we've, we've quite an interesting story to tell about Hockey Island. Um, and the pictures you see in front of you were um, probably unthinkable when I first started with the organization in 2005. So as Thomas said, I worked in British hockey. I was fortunate enough to go to the Olympic Games, World Cup, Commonwealth Games, um, won a silver medal in the Commonwealth Games. Whilst I was involved in British hockey, I was mainly involved in the women. Um, and my wife is Irish, we have five children. So we chose to move to Ireland while I was still working with British hockey. Um, and I was aware that at that time, Irish hockey um, had no high performance system. They had no full-time coach of either team. Uh, we had a volunteer coach for our women's team from the Netherlands, from, from uh, Thomas's country, from where many are you from, Rita Cooper, who, who, who did very well on, on very limited resources. Um, so I was comfortable moving to Ireland in the knowledge that those jobs were coming up and that maybe I could use some of my experience to, to, to make a difference. Um, but it's very different from anyone who knows hockey in the Netherlands. I was in the Netherlands, would you believe, this morning in Amsterdam in Schiphol coming home. Um, and uh, I know I've been involved in collegiate uh, sport a little bit in Boston and some of our players are currently uh, playing in... Um, in the American collegiate system um, with, with brilliant scholarships. And the levels of funding in both of, your, uh, both of your domains is far higher than we have in Ireland. We're a small country, we only have 5 million people. Um, and only 12 million euro a year is committed to all of the high performance sports. Um, so even when I came from British hockey, it was quite a shock to come into a, to an environment where there was a total lack of funds. Uh, but I don't, and never will, and one of the things we've always tried to insist in our players, we would never use that as an excuse for not achieving. So what I'm gonna do, I read some of your questions, which were absolutely fantastic. So I changed the presentation a good bit this morning. So hopefully some of your questions um, will be asked along the way. So as Thomas said, then I came to Ireland and I worked for seven years and initially I was the performance director, the first ever performance director, the first ever paid full-time coach with the national men's team who I was with for four years. Um, so what I wanna do is just give you an idea around my leadership values. I know that was discussed yesterday because that's really important. And then just talk about the four key drivers I use to build a system which has led both of the teams to achieve some level of success. Um, and I say some level because there's always a desire to achieve more. Um, and talk about the systems that we set up, um, where we were then and where we are now. And then just show you a comparison. So our senior women's team is now quite well funded, not as well funded as other teams around the world. The US team would be, would be full time. And the Dutch system is largely through their clubs, but most of the athletes are more or less full-time players uh, if they choose to be. Our development teams, so none of our four under 16, under 18, under 21 or under 23 teams get any financial support whatsoever. And so as the, as the head coach of the under 23, which incorporates the under 21 team, my, my start of my year is a zero budget. Now that's changed a little bit through work that I've done. We now have some philanthropic support uh, through a donor that gives us given this year, given us 30,000 euro to invest in me, to do invest in our players, uh, but we start with zero. So um, essentially it's quite a challenging environment. So what I'm then gonna do is talk about, well, what happened during lockdown and the two very contrasting situations of a state funded team like the women's team to a totally non-funded team like our development team um, and just talk about the different approaches. And the important for starting with the leadership values is hopefully you can see my values uh, come out when I talk about, well, what did we do with the development team when we had the, the COVID lockdown? So just a, a brief introduction to my leadership values. So I call myself a value-based leader. So um, I'm really interested in what people value. <laughs> and what I value. So I'm gonna talk about so, some of the things that I value. So um, as a coach educator, one of the key things I try to do is to encourage people to coach the person, not the sport. 
So actually the, knowing the person and being able to engage and connect with the person is most important before you're then able to, to make corrections and changes. And I'm sure you've all come across teachers and educators and coaches and other people in your life that um, they don't ever connect with you and they just start, start shouting at you or telling you what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing. Um, and, and generally my, my experience is that people shut down. So if we have a relationship in terms of I understand what makes you tick and what you enjoy, what motivates you, what you like, what you don't like, how you like your feedback. One of the first questions I always have with my players is, um, how do you like feedback? Um, uh, you don't always get an honest answer, but at least we've had that conversation because then I can frame things and understand what makes them feel good and what helps motivate them, what they don't like, etc. And uh, you probably talked a little bit. I see you've got five groups and one of them is the All Black. This, this one came from the All Blacks, but we essentially did this in our programs beforehand. Better people make better athletes. So we look at the whole person. And um, so you'll see there's a development plan in an individual development plan in there. That's page one, which covers the hockey. And a lot of that is about the mental and lifestyle management of the athlete and key things that they need to develop to support their, their athletes. Because most athletes go on to be very successful business people or successful in their lives because of the skills they develop. So I look at that the other way. If we develop those skills before they come senior athletes, they're gonna be better athletes. Um, so, so hopefully that makes sense. And then player empowerment's a key thing for me. So I hand over a lot of decision-making to the athletes. Um, and all of these things are related to how we dealt with COVID. And so autonomy is really important. I'm, I'm sure our Dutch friends know what autonomy means, but it, it basically allows the athlete to some, have some control over what they do. Now, because our, 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 our programs are self-funded um, with our development team, I also give some autonomy to the, to the parents because mostly the parents will finance the players to be part of our programs. So I have to have connection with both the athletes and the parents, which is really important. And we now, when we went to our last tournament last uh, year in Valencia, every single parent group or support group came to the tournament and were immensely supportive because we had a really good connection. And yet the tournament didn't go especially well, especially at the start. So, and then finally, the ability to be humble um, whilst elite athletes can often appear arrogant. I don't believe most of them are arrogant. I think they're trying to, they're craving to be the best they can be and therefore they might have to be a little bit selfish. And therefore we need to allow that to develop and evolve, but we need to keep them grounded to the floor so that they're humble, winning, losing, uh, if they're being super successful or not. Um, and actually, life as an elite athlete is, is often quite a miserable time. Okay, I'm from an academic background. So during my time, my latter part of my time with Irish Hockey, I started a doctorate and now I lecture. So I'm lecturing mainly in sports coaching and education. Um, I work a lot in coach development. And there are lots of different theories about the best way of doing things. Um, and, and I'm sure you you may have heard of uh, Ryan and Decky. So these these guys, uh, theory is self-determination theory. So this is the one I like and feel resonates most with my coaching and therefore how I would see um, it's important um, for our athletes to be in a program. So I've talked about one of my values is um, empowerment. That's where the autonomy comes in. Belonging is my connection. Um, ensuring we build competencies, the other skills around them, the things that they, they need and then everything we do has to have a meaning and a purpose. And that's probably the greatest challenge now COVID has thrown up. Because of all of a sudden, we had a great program for this summer. We were going to America. I'd organized a Six Nations tournament in Dublin um, that was going to be streamed live. And we had a sponsor and we had all the parents involved. And all that's gone now. So why, if they, what, what are they actually training for? Um, so that everything we do has to have a meaning and a purpose um, in that sense. So hopefully that just gives a little bit of a background for me. I want to start with this question because 
I, I, I hear from my sons, they're always talking about high performance cars and uh, you know, even there's high performance washing detergent now. But what is high performance? And I'm gonna come back to this image in a while once you've had a, a, a moment to think about it. So you're gonna get five minutes in your groups. The person with the first birthday, so you have gotta work that out super quickly. If you're first of January, you know you're gonna be the first, you're gonna be ready to, to, to label them down. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna see um, what you came up with, but we won't be able to go into this late. So in five minutes, three bullet points, what is high performance sport? So if we can open the, um, the breakout rooms. Yep, rooms are opening. Dave, we need you to come to the States to talk about building connections with parents. Yeah, no problem. No American problem. sport American sport parents are jerks. Maybe, maybe that's a good thing to discuss at the end. <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> have, have, have they all gone? And, uh, yeah, the students are gone. No, no. It's, it's it's hopefully, Whitney, hopefully, Whitney, they're all gone. <laughs> you know, it's... It, There's one. Karma still there. Oh, Karma has to go. Karma has to go to the Red Sox. One second. Are they mixed groups? Yes. Yeah. So they they have both American and Dutch students. Yeah. Is time there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, Did I'm trying. Need to send Car yeah, I'm trying. Okay. Did I try to log in and out again? Like, log out and log in again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll remove you and then uh, I can put you back in. Okay, Carmen? Yeah. Great. Um, but all jokes aside, there is significant challenges and damage being done by youth sport parents in this country. Um, Lots of, yeah, we, uh, we, we, lots of problems. We did, um, uh, I, I worked with the elite uh, coaches in Ireland uh, as a coach developer. So I was a mentor. We, one of them now is in America as head of your boxing, uh, Billy Walsh. And we did a lot of work in this area. And we've also done a, quite a lot of research into um, sort of bringing the parents with you rather than pushing against them. So happy to come over anytime I'm due over in Boston. In, I have a scholarship to come to Boston in... March or April next year, if I'm able. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of data here about the point at which there's a drop off in youth participation. Um, and then the long tail damage that does when, when you have youth cutting out at a particular time. Um, and absolutely one of the drivers uh, is is an often very negative relationship between parents and coaches and the the young kids and if they if the children have a negative experience where they are part of a negative interaction between their parents and their coaches then they they quit sport um, and we just can't we can't culturally get our arms around um, how we get parents out of the way and allow their kids to have fun and be coached by coaches and not coached by parents. And it's leading to participation drop off, particularly among girls. Um, so it, it really is a problem. Sure. Do you, do you think it's particularly bad because of the drive for the sort of scholarship, the NCAA? Absolutely, that's part of it. And I think, and Craig, you can jump in partner. You know, it it's also just, cultural. It's this, this idea that parents are living out their, their dreams through their kids, that the, the performance of their children is a proxy for who they are as parents. Um, it's all of that. And it's for scholarships and it's for just the social cachet of your kid being the starting pitcher for the Little League Baseball team that goes to the World Series. Um, but 
but like I said, it's causing kids to leave team sport early, um, and that has devastating public health consequences and, and other problems. Yeah, even though even though the scholarship thing is a myth, um, I don't think enough parents realize that there's really not. I mean, outside of you know, the handful of sports, obviously football, men's, women's basketball, and volleyball, you know, the amount of scholarship money that you can actually um, receive for some of these sports is it's not worth the investment. Um, so I think it has a lot to do with that. What Whitney was saying that social cachet. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm meeting, we've got three American girls who've just arrived in, in Limerick, believe it or not, because they're, they're, their league's cancelled and they're coming over here to train. Um, so it's going to be interesting uh, because cause things are going ahead here as it stands. So they just want to continue their development um, because obviously there's no hockey for them now. So... I also think it's um, we're talking about a, a, a younger age uh, because these are like uh, seventy year, eighteen year, nineteen year olds, uh, David. I think, yeah. but the, the, the parental pressure on the kids to perform and the expectation levels are unreal. Yeah. It's happening a little bit in uh, Europe as well. You see this uh, totally. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, it's it's a pack of expectations also about early specialization and all those kind of things. So. Uh, indeed, I think the core uh, uh, idea has already been uh, said by uh, Whitney. It's uh, the lack of enjoyment in the end, but uh, just uh, the pressure to perform, which takes away all the fun. Uh, you see also these injury patterns at the younger age, which are unbelievable. Uh, yeah, but th this is needs something that needs to be picked up from uh, yeah, by the schools as well, and yeah, the way they look at sports. Uh, I think we need to go back into. Uh, uh, into operational mode. So Whitney, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, five yeah, minutes are just... over, so I'm gonna let everybody back in. Okay, guys, so um, is everybody back? Uh, just a sec, almost everybody. I think in about 20 se seconds, everybody is back. Are we good? Oh, okay. Man. We're just waiting for one team, FC Barcelona. But they they should be back in about ten seconds. But the the rest of the groups are back, and yeah, everybody's back. Okay, excellent. So, listen, um, I, I'm sure you found that quite a difficult discussion, and actually, if you read the research, um, that the, there is a total lack of, lack of clear definition because what high performance is in one country. And in one sport can be very different to what it is in another sport and another country. So over here, um, I call our collegiate hockey, field hockey, um, it's more of a social game. Um, whereas in, in the US, it, it, that would often be considered performance, if not high performance sport, uh, because of the training level and stuff. So through my, through my own doctorate, I did quite a lot of work in, um, my doctorate was into how we develop elite coaches. So the coaches working in high performance. And the definitions of high performance coaching for me gives us a really good understanding of why it's such a difficult domain to work in. And when we talk about COVID, I think that really emphasizes uh, the domain where we were at at that time when we had lockdown in many countries and certainly in Ireland. So um, if we just look at uh, Chris Cushion 2007, so he talks about structured improvisation. So you can't reduce coaching to a set of rules or guidelines. You can't take out a textbook and go, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do this. Because there are so many variables and it's dynamic. That means it's changing all the time. So even if you just think about a training session or a game, there are 
up to maybe 25, 30 people involved on the pitch. Then there's all the staff. Then there's what's going on on the pitch, what's going off the pitch, uh, what influence other people are having, parents, cameras, etc. And then at any time you have to, to change your, you might be winning, therefore you might change your strategy, you might be losing, and therefore you have to change your strategy. So um, the researchers have started to talk about coaching at high performance levels being on the edge of chaos and trying to bring some order to chaos. Now you can't totally structure chaos um, uh, because that will have a negative effect. So this whole idea of the edge of chaos really is a key quality that, that anyone working in high performance needs to be and the ability to bring order to it. So, so that's really important if you think about those many different variables. Um, so now we understand how kind of different high performances to maybe what some of the stuff you wrote, you probably talked about the level, you probably talked about the amount of time athletes were, whether they were full-time, part-time, what resources or facilities they had available to them. Um, I'm just going to go back a slide because possibly the best definition of high performance is, is, was demonstrated by this story I can tell you when I was Irish men's coach. So there's a guy called An Anders, Ang uh, Anders Ericsson, who is a very well-known sports scientist in high performance sport. And he defined high performance once as we all love to look at beautiful things um, like I live opposite the mountains. We built our house in Ireland to overlook the mountains. Um, and, and most people enjoy to do that. The difference with high performance is people involved in real high performance are not happy just looking at it. They've got to conquer it or they've got to climb it. So the, the story comes from when we took the men's team to Cape Town. So that's Table Mountain. You can't see it on this picture, but there's a lovely cable car. So we went up the cable car. We had a, an afternoon off. Uh, in 12 days, we had one afternoon, one full day. Uh, recovery. So we went up Table Mountain and we used to train early in the morning because it was very warm. It was 38, 39 degrees. So training would often be at 8 a.m. And two days later at 8 a.m. we were six players of the squad missing. And they got back at about midday and what they tried to do was to climb Table Mountain from the other side themselves. They took a minibus and those six players were not the best players in our team but they were the six who drove the team to qualify for the Olympics. And that was the first time Ireland had qualified for the Olympics since 1908, um, when they qualified for Rio. So, um, so that just gives you a, a perspective and that's how I always describe high performance. Um, it's about, not just about the achievement, it's about the journey to achieving and the will to achieve. So when I took over as performance director of Irish hockey in 2005, the men were ranked 24th in the world, the women were ranked 16th in the world. Um, I was publicly quoted at the time as saying that um, uh, we had the ability within the teams to reach the top 12 and people, including some of the players, laughed at me. So one of the things we lacked was a high performance culture and we lacked a belief system. And then since that time, and I'm going to talk about the four key pillars that I used to build the system, we've won a European bronze, which doesn't sound big, but five of the top six teams in the world are European. Um, and we beat England in the, in the bronze medal. We lost to the Netherlands in the semi-final, 1-0. They went on to win the final. And then we beat England. Now, England have a, a five to six million euro program per annum, full-time athletes. Four of the players who played for England that day are, had formerly played for Ireland, but chosen to, to defect, um, to go to England because they get paid an annual salary. Um, and we beat them in London. So it was particularly special um, that, but it, it signposted us then for the qualification to the Olympics in 2016. I'm going to talk about the women winning the uh, silver in the World Cup in 2018, because we had a whole load of uh, KPIs, critical performance indicators and goals, but we never talked about winning a World Cup. And then just last year, we, we qualified last November um, to, for the, the Tokyo Olympics. That's the first time a women's team of any nature has qualified for Ireland for Olympic Games and the first time a women's hockey team has qualified. The silver medal in the World Cup, if, you, if I just want to put this in perspective, in, in Ireland, we're dominated by Gaelic Games. 
So they're amateur games that are not played internationally. And that takes out 600,000 people straight away. So hockey is an exceptionally small sport. And no Irish team had ever got to a World Cup final in any sport. So for our women to achieve that, that was really important. Okay. And then, so from going from 24th in the world um, and 16th, the men uh, rose to ninth at their best and the women were currently ranked eighth. So it was quite a big turnaround. Um, and just this, this, uh, this, this was a defining moment because this started to really build the belief and the belief that the men got from this getting to the semi-finals of the European Cup, getting a medal in London over England was really important because when you're a small country by to a big country, so the Dutch will recognize this as Germany, big country, Dutch, smaller country, they're, they're your rivals. And, and, and we often see that they, the grass is greener and everything's easier for them. So that really helped believe our belief system. So just a little bit about Ireland. So when I arrived, I had to learn this. Uh, we live in the Republic of Ireland, which is Ireland with the, the, the green, white and, and orange flag. Um, but the north of Ireland is actually part of the United Kingdom. So they're part of Brexit. Um, so, um, but we're an all-island sport. So people from the north, they might have a British UK passport, but they play for the Republic of Ireland, uh, for the Irish team, which is a, a merger of the two. So when I arrived, I was suddenly uh, found that there were six different whole stakeholders. So Sport Ireland was from Ireland. Uh, sport Northern Ireland is obviously from Northern Ireland. Then there was the Institute of Sport in the South, Institute of Sport in the North, a combined Olympic Federation, an Irish Federation of Sport, and then all the different sponsors. Um, so it was quite a complex system to come into. Um, and actually it got worse because we had no paid staff. We had no national training facilities, no carding. They never even considered giving a team, especially a hockey team, a carding system so they got no funding to be elite athletes so our athletes were effectively working full-time and trying to train, train like full-time athletes the mindset or understanding of high performance was non-existent we had very little budget um, and a lack of belief um, and dis disjointed structures so what i tried to do was to give us clear aims so everybody knew the direction we were heading in to find good people that would help us achieve those aims and then build structures and systems for the long term. Because what I did was I researched other successful team systems and French soccer, Spanish soccer or football, um, the, 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 the Australian women's team. Um, when you look at any team, it takes about seven years to build a successful system, minimum. Okay, so, so we wanted long, robust systems and processes, and we wanted a no excuse culture. And culture was one of the first places that I went to um, uh, in that sense. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview. So, if you, this is our, um, when I arrived, our budget was 225,000 for eight teams. Um, that was eight management teams, so about 250 athletes. Um, we got that up to about 800,000, and this is, uh, the last two years that you can see on the sheet. So if you look there now, Hockey Island, it's got a star by it. Last year we got 520,000 and this year, Olympic year, we got 730,000. If you compare that with British hockey and their women are the Olympic medal holders, sorry to remind you that the Dutchies because they lost on, uh, they won on, on penalties. They got 17 million sterling, which is about 19, 000, 19 million euro across a four year period. So that's 5 million euro minimum per annum compared to last year, 500,000. So that not only do they have 11 times as many players, they have uh, 10 times as much funding minimum. So that's why that result against England was really important when I talked about the men's uh, victory. So what I did, we got very clear aims. They were bold and they were ambitious about qualifying for World Cups and Olympics and then being successful. This is our organogram. So this was the system that I built to support those systems. And then I spent a lot of time finding good people. For me, it's not the experience or the qualifications that people have. It's about finding young, up and coming, ambitious, innovative people who think outside of the box. 
and who are prepared to challenge what's always gone before them. And within high performance, there should always be a lot of discussion and debate. Okay, so um, so that, that's something I put in place. And then I tried to put in this aligned system. So I knew, although we had a reasonable uh, chance of success with the group when I first moved over with the 2005 group, in fact, in 2008, when I was coach, we, we narrowly missed out on the Olympics on two occasions. But what we did then is we built a talent development system that I called Hook for Life. And what you're trying to do in Hook for Life is to take these, this girl's in the middle. This is from my local club. This, this is school hockey. Uh, within your school, you then get played your four regions or provinces in Ireland. So there's Munster, Leinster, Ulster and Connacht. So we live in Munster. So if you're a really good school player, you try and get picked for your province. And then um, you're obviously trying to play for Ireland. And then what we tried to do was align and systematically develop the players to fast track them to become the best senior players possible. So the fact that we didn't get success until 2016 was not surprising with the men or the women with 2018 because it takes a long time to develop the system and then develop the athletes. If you look at my program, I'm very overt about our objectives. So this is the national, um, uh, the national talent group or the under 23 group. So we will define the training hours. They do 84 strength sessions a year, a minimum of 30 uh, conditioning running sessions, although that has more than doubled this year because of COVID. But our program outputs, what we're looking to do is get five players per annum to play at the senior level and three of them to, to achieve more than 50 caps. So that's my role. And I love doing this. I could easily be a national senior coach, but I love doing this. Of the GB team that won gold in, in Rio, nine of those girls trained with me for five years. And I believe that the, the, the platform that that gave them to move forward is really important. It's a difficult one because most coaches want, they want the credit for having achieved the gold medal. I'm quite happy sitting back watching those girls on telly, knowing that I contributed in some way towards their development. So this all fits into an overall system. So from six right up to 60, if you want to carry on playing, um, that builds on what the coach does, what the player does, how we structure our games, sports science input. And we recently reviewed that, which you can find online. Um, and what we've done is we've done a lot of research into developing high performance systems. So we've reviewed the system against the most recent research that my colleague Anya McNamara has done quite a lot of work on. And if you look here, some of the key things that are challenges for us, we have schools, we have clubs, we have provinces and we have national teams plus college teams. So we have five types of team to get a truly aligned system where every coach, where every conditioning coach is doing the same thing is not easy because they all conflict with each other. So what you have to do is to have a long-term vision and a purpose, which was far more difficult in 2005 than it is now because we've qualified both men and women's teams for Olympics and we have a silver medal in the women's necks and a bronze medal, European medal around the men's necks. So now people can see that the long-term is better, but bringing people together is an exceptionally difficult thing to do because coaches are egotistical. They want their club team, they want their school team to win and to come first. So that's where the parents come in because the parents have to help work in that respect. So what you need is a lot of coherent messages and support from all, all, all areas. And I won't go into that now, but we're trying to bring everybody along with us, all those different stakeholders. And that early success has no link to long-term success. So uh, the success of our under 16, under 18, and our development team is not important as long as we're getting the right number of players developed to move forward to make an impact for our women's team. So basically, I, I, our program is subservient to the, senior, uh, to the senior program. And you can only really tell um, what that does um, how successful you've been down the line. One of the things we've really worked hard on is building the psychological skills. We call them, um, sorry if you haven't heard them, PCDE. 
uh, the performance characteristics of developing excellence. So they complete a, a questionnaire and there's some things we found we're really good at. Now, this is really important because at moments of crisis, you need to know who your vulnerable athletes are and who do you actively seek out support for. So what you have here is uh, there's two areas here. The, the dash line is the ideal profile and the blue is um, where our team currently is. So there's a few areas that we need to boot. Now, a key area is seeking and using social support down on the bottom left here. So we knew when we hit COVID, this was really important that we created a social network for our athletes. We have WhatsApp group and they have to contact in every time they do a physical or a gym session, they have to put a photograph in. We have a daily monitoring system called Kitman, which they have to monitor as well. So we get to see how they're doing every single day. So myself and the strength and conditioning coach, who is an absolute godsend, we work very closely on monitoring the, 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 how the athletes are doing. Here's another one, adverse response to failure. So they're really poor at not being, because they're perfectionists. So when things don't go right, they struggle and things weren't going right in COVID. And that tends to, that tends to link into their academic world as well. So I'll come back to that. So we wanted to develop the mental side as well as the thing, and this, this links into our culture. So one of the most important things we did within Irish Hockey as a whole with our staff and then with each team is we built a shared belief system and attached the belief system to a set of performance behaviors. So you've seen this all the time. We would have the athletes, even if we had them 20 hours a week, we still, that's 368 hours in a week. We don't see them for 300, nearly 350 hours a week. So what are they, sorry, 150 hours a week. So what are they doing in that time? So even if you've got your governance structures, your protocols and your processes and policies, that's not important. It's what goes on beneath the surface that you don't see. So the way we did this, we, we took from business, uh, Edgar Shine's um, three levels of building a culture. What was, what was our artifacts? We've associated really clearly with our Irishness, what's important to be Irish, um, like the All Blacks, the hacker, the black shirts, the, um, the silver fern. But we've also consciously been, built a belief set of values. And that's why I delivered my values first, because we have to understand what are the individual values and attitudes within our group and how can you mold those collectively to build a collective group of values, accepting that there are different types of person in a group and that makes it stronger. And then we consciously talk about performance behaviors. And that was when I first started, we had to move from these easily shapeable things to the, to, the, to the performance behaviors in our younger athletes that were durable. And if you think back to the six athletes who went up Table Mountain, they already had those. So we use those as role models with our younger athletes. So they were the four kind of things that I, I looked to develop. And I know some of you have got some questions around those things. So we, we went to London um, in 2018 and we were the, there were 16 teams in the World Cup and we were ranked 15th. We were in a pool of four. And if you came bottom of your pool of four, which was where we were ranked, we, we should have come bottom. Um, we were in a pool with America, India and England, the hosts. Um, and we weren't expected to get out of it, but we actually topped the pool despite losing to England because England and India drew. And what really got us off to a good start was we beat the USA. And then we oddly played India then in a quarter final, which we won on penalties. So that mental side of the game was really important when that kicked in. We knew who could, who could come on. So then we went to a semi final against Spain. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know field hockey, um, but I'm just going to play a bit of video here. So there, there were 10,000 people. Um, and what, what, what always makes me laugh, having born and grown up in England, that the Irish don't particularly like, when it comes to sport, the, the Irish don't like the English, but the English will always support the Irish. So we turned a 10,000-seater stadium 
into um, into a green uh, a, a green domain. So this is the semi final. We've never played ever in a semi final, as I said earlier. No team in Ireland had ever played in a in a semi final at World Cup level. Um, and the game the game finished one all, and it went to penalty shuttles. So you can see each team has only scored one each. So it wasn't, you could tell the pressure kicking in. And watch this. Here comes Riera. Riera to the top of the circle. She paused against you. Look for the lob. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? So now it goes to sudden death. Whoever misses, whoever misses goes through. And this is my favourite player. She actually plays in the Netherlands. I think this girl is one of the best players in the world. Our keeper, Aisha McFerrin, who spent four years in America on scholarship. And this is to go to a World Cup final. So the team ranked 15. One opportunity to go to a World Cup final. Okay, I'm going to move on before I start crying, because um, obviously that evokes a lot of emotion. So the system that we built, and particularly the culture that we built, was really strong. And what was really interesting about the girls' approach to that, because I did a lot of the work, early work in terms of building their culture towards that World Cup, was they wanted to enjoy themselves because nobody had ever been to a World Cup and they didn't want to kind of not experience something they'd never done before, which if you get too aroused or too over-motivated or feel all the pressure. Um, so they just said they go out and enjoy themselves and give it their best. And I genuinely believe that that got them to the final. Um, and all the hard work that they'd done in their preparation allowed itself to manifest itself because they were relaxed. So there were massive benefits then uh, to this, and this relates to, to, to where we're going now with COVID. They now went on to sport uh, team carding. So Irish hockey receives money that it divvies out to the players that allows the players to take time off work, to get expenses uh, to be paid, basically. They got two major sponsors and individual now have sponsors. They weren't allowed to use the Institute of Sport because they weren't highly enough ranked. And now they get full access to full-time staff, gym, medical, psych, performance analysis, fitness testing, nutrition, lifestyle, and more guidance and guidance and guidance, which is really important. Um, they got an employer support system. So most of our athletes are with a company that is sport friendly. Um, and many of them are able now to take periods off and go back to their job. Um, and that was really important when it came to the COVID. Okay. So the impact was massive. And then lo and behold, we went in October last year, we played Canada in a two match series that broke the records in Ireland because it was the largest attended women's event with over six and a half thousand people. And we qualified for Tokyo. Um, which again was a, a brilliant night and we did it on penalties. So we then went into a program that was the best we ever had. So the athletes went Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, on Thursdays and Fridays, they were regionally based. They had acclimation sessions. So you have to get in a heat chamber about a year out to get the full benefits of acclimatizing to the humidity and the heat of, of Tokyo which obviously should, should just be coming, no, would they just be home now, or we would just be home. They were allowed to participate in their clubs. Many of the players have played overseas. They now came home. They were on three strength and conditioning sessions per week with recovery. And then they had a really good uh, match series. So the plan in March was to go on the 16th to South Africa. Uh, they'd been in Jan January already for three weeks. And China had, COVID had started at that point and China were already there. South Africa were there. We had something like 10 matches. So everything looked great. The, the, all the players were at home. The, the staff were now on contract so that they were bought out of work and they had 24 funded players for the first time. So it was all uh, looked like utopia. From an under 21 perspective, 
this was our program. So we had a zero budget, but uh, with innovation, we had a reciprocal agreement with America to come over and play six matches where they would accommodate us this year and then we would accommodate America next year. So this was part of my job, doing stuff as cheaply as you can. We then, because we lack competition in tournaments, we organized a Six Nations tournament with the Netherlands, Germany, Chile, India, and Canada. So four different, uh, four different countries. We, we put it in a university, so it was very cheap for them to come. And we found a sponsor for the tournament that it more or less paid for itself. So going to a Six Nation tournament would normally cost 30 to 40,000 euro, and this was paying for itself. We then, I like to have a go be teenager month. So ensure that these kids don't realize that they are totally missing out on going around Europe, going into railing, going away with their friends, being with their family partners. So we had a month off and then we came back and European hockey had put an eight nations in place. How do we fund that? Where we said, no, uh, it's a 76,000 budget. If you budgeted that in most countries, that would cost about 130,000. But with relationships, um, we got a donor, 25,000. We then got a sponsorship, 15,000. We would, with using our parents, would run the tournament. That would make 15,000 euro. So actually more than paid for the tournament. Um, and then if, if a player attended every single thing, the 80 gym sessions and every single training day and match, um, it would cost them 800 euro. But of 80,000, nearly 80,000 euro, that's, and it's divided across the year. So having a relationship with the parents and having the identity, the senior team had the Green Army, calling ourselves the Junior Green Army. We got support of the parents and they do all the fundraising now with my support. So I set the tournament up, get the teams in, and they run the tournament um, with support and direction. So the difference between the senior team and where they are hitting COVID with all these supports, fully funded, not working, uh, psychologists, nutritionists, analysts, coaches, lifestyle support, uh, employer support, it's a very different world for the under 23 team. And yet I won't let that be an excuse and I won't let us not run a proper program like this. If you look at the number of gym sessions in there, the number of running sessions, etc. So COVID, we had lockdown on the 13th of March. Um, it lasted to the end of June, although there was a slight loosening in early June. And the Irish government, I think it helps being an island. It helps being a small country. Uh, but we also had as our Taoiseach, that's our prime minister, he's a doctor. So very good having a doctor. So he was exceptional. And I think we were surrounded by exceptional government people. And they introduced a phase, four phase reintroduction. Now we haven't quite completed the fourth phase because numbers have crept up a little bit. So what I'd like to just finish with now is just talk about well, what were the decisions we made in this really difficult scenario. So you understand what we built. Hopefully now you understand and you've got to remember, nine of our athletes in the last year and a half have gone from being in a program where they have to pay, and often our manager will be doing the cooking, to one where it's fully funded and they get paid. So we have to manage that transition very carefully, because if you remember, that's the important, one of the reasons why it's so important to be humble. Be humble about what you have, and when you've got more, continue to be humble as my phrase with the girls is be humble and keep on being humble. All right. The keep on is sometimes harder. So the senior program with its focus on Tokyo, they had a budget nearly 500,000 from the government. They had all the staff they needed. They had all the protocols and policies, um, but they also had this trip to South Africa, which was allowed at the time they would have left Ireland. Compare that to, the, to our group then, the under 23 group. We're focusing on Paris. Yes, we had a great program because that's what motivates players. They wanna play against the Netherlands and go to America. We were gonna play in North Carolina um, where the weather was hot and we could, if some of them were really good, they would have got some acclimatization to, to move into the senior team, maybe to go to the Olympics. But 
other than myself, every single member of our staff is also voluntary. So they give up their own time. Um, and our, the major part of our program for the year happened outside of the collegiate year and outside of the domestic competition year. So whilst the seniors had already had a lot of their program, our program was ahead of us when, when COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, they all had the, the changes of online in learning and exams. So if you think about it, the, the senior program were under strict Sport Island guidelines. And when that happens, they have to be 100% squeaky clean, which slowed down a lot of the decision making because it went from government to sport department to liaison and then out. It took a lot of times to make decisions. But when decisions were made, they then had the full-time staff to support them. We had a little bit of control from our hockey island, but to be honest with you, because I'm a performance performance director, I more or less run the program. And I had to call the shots and I had very little support or guidance. Did we go to America? Did we still try and run our Six Nations? Did we continue with our strength and conditioning or just did we take a complete break? Did we allow the athletes to study during that break um, or what? So that they, they, they were the many decisions. So what I'd like you to do in these five groups is in the eight minutes that you have, uh, you might want to take a photo of this or screenshot it. I'll leave it up. You've got to make the decision on, on what the two groups, the decisions had to make. So do the uh, South African, do they, the seniors go to South Africa. Now, South Africa had under 200 cases and was actually had more, less total cases than Ireland had per day at that time. All right, so they could have gone. It was for three weeks. China were already there. China were tested twice. The South African team, who they were also playing, were going to get tested. Um, so in essence, it was safer than being in Ireland. Okay. And then when the full lockdown, do you give them a complete break? And even though some of them can't go back to work because they're on sabbatical or their work isn't going. Okay, so there's your two decisions. The All Blacks, what do you think the key challenges for the athletes, the players were during that total lockdown? They were going to Tokyo. The decision not to, to take out Tokyo was made seven weeks after we were on lockdown. San Francisco, we are now back training for the first time. They have their first training camp for the senior team this weekend. What do you think their key concerns are? Because I can share them with you. And then Barcelona and Celtic, the two football clubs. Tell me, do we go to America for 10 days? Do we have our Six Nations at the end of June with those countries coming, India, etc.? And then Celtic, if you can think, do we continue? We had a whole month, go be teenager month. Do we take the break in July, given the lockdown was till the end of June? Or do, or do we go back and change the schedule and train? Okay. And then you've been through lockdown, most of you. So what skills do you think the junior players developed and what were the benefits they found of being in lockdown? So they're your tasks, folks. You're going to have to be elect a leader straight away. You have eight minutes. And I really look forward to what you, what you hear. If you want to write it down, write it down so you can show Put up your sheet on the camera. Okay, let's uh, go to David, breakout room. David, due to time, we're going to do five minutes in the breakout room. So five minutes, perfect. Um, if you have two of the questions, just take the top one. Well, no, I think I read top. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Have they all gone? Just one. I think Barbara is having some issues. What's the so last? Well? I've got about five minutes. I'm going to have about five minutes, ten minutes left. Thomas, did you say to twenty past? The free Q and A is from ten to twenty. Sure. So. Uh, actually, for this, uh, we're, we're sort of like running out of time here. So okay, we well, I'm we have, just, 
I have okay, a, I have an I'm idea. gonna. I, I won't let them feedback. I'm just gonna tell them. What no, we no, did. no, no. Let them feedback because they're talking about it. That's exactly. Can I be Dutch for a second? Yeah. Um, uh, let them feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because if they if they if they uh, discuss uh, topics uh, among themselves, they need to be able to share. Yeah, so, of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I would love them to share. Uh, you lead, uh, and what we do is we organically flow it into the free Q and A. Is that a good idea? Organically, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, because now this is the essence of the whole uh, uh, evening uh, or the show is that we try to sort of make them think about what type, types of uh, um, uh, measurements you need to take or decisions you need to make under these uh, given circumstances. That's very nice, but they need to un interact with you as a feedback master. And um, I have two questions actually from the group itself. Um, I'll see if there's a time to lead it up, but um, one of them is, what has been your greatest challenge in adapting the way in you coach and manage high performance under the given circumstances? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, uh, I mean, management needs to understand, right? And that's what we try to learn them. Uh, and the other one is, um, which countries seem to have dealt best with the high performance setups? Huh? Which, which countries seem to have dealt best with the pandemic? And please explain why. So it's a very spicy ending, I think. I can't answer think? the second one because I genuinely don't know. Oh, so, okay. We tell them all the time, learn from the best. But at the moment, you're the benchmark. <laughs> Mm. Okay. Hint. Okay. Yes. It's not us. <laughs> um, just time. How many minutes do we have uh, in uh, the rooms? Uh, two minutes left. Two minutes left. So, uh, one of the rooms uh, first. Uh, you do. You do that, uh, David. Uh, I can answer the question. Yeah, I can answer. Yeah. The we might put up the, uh, uh, no, we, we will not. So I have one, two, three, four more slides. Um, and that will organically grow into the, they're, they're explaining what did happen. Yeah, okay. After 10 minutes, I will hand over to Bartle uh, because he will introduce the uh, work groups uh, on their topics and coach them. Are we fully clear? So from 9.10 to 9.20? Yeah, it's you. Yeah. There, there was a really good question on there about um, a tweet that I put out. I'm going to let them in, by the way, just <laughs> so you know. It's not.
just uh, waiting on one group. All right, everybody is in. Okay, great. So we're going to go through this quickly, and then I'm going to show you what did actually happen because you've considered some of the some of the key uh, decisions. Um, so, can somebody from the, uh, the Boston Red Sox group tell me would you have gone to South Africa given that it was a safer environment to be in? Yeah. Um... We had a hard time because of recency bias. We want to say no right away. But if we're making this decision in March um, and based on the information we were given, um, the other teams were screened. There weren't cases. It was safer in South Africa with the number of cases. And, you know, traveling with a team to um, a tournament like this, you know, they're usually fairly isolated from the general public anyway you know hotel games stuff like that so we said in march we would have made the decision to travel to south africa okay and that's interesting because that's the decision i would have made but um the staff and some of the athletes uh, were very concerned about getting into back into the country uh, so it wasn't the going it was the coming back um, so actually they, they chose not to go and they actually lost the flight costs. So they would have paid for the flights in full and they chose not to go to South Africa. Now given, and, and, and I think your, your rationale is very relevant. Um, and that would have been my rationale. Um, but the difficulty was that the government wouldn't give them a guideline, but they also couldn't guarantee they could get back into the country. So that was one of the key things. Um, would you have given the athletes a break especially when the Tokyo was canceled, uh, was postponed by one year. So we didn't talk about this as a group, but I can answer, you know, I've been a coach and um, I've seen just since the crisis started and um, I, I'm a swimmer, so I can speak to this a little bit. I've seen athletes coming back and putting up really good performances because of a forced break where maybe they were training too hard before. Um, so in my sense, just putting on my coaching hat a little bit, I probably would have because sometimes athletes need that break mentally and physically. Okay. And, and that's exactly what the coach on the management team decided to do. So for some of them, it was the first time they got three months off. The problem with it was that their their carding funding was also withdrawn. So for some of them that thought that they were getting money to live for a period of time, that was that did not transpire. And that was the difficulty for many of the athletes. And that made that quite a difficult decision. Um, although I don't believe it's caused any major problems. Um, and for some of them, particularly those who've been nursing injuries over a period of time, it allowed for some really good prehab and proper conditioning um, without the, the, you know, the, the wear and tear of constantly uh, uh, running on a hard surface, twisting and turning. Um, okay, let, we'll stick with the senior team. So the All Blacks, what were the key challenges for the players, do you think, during, during the COVID lockdown? So you know now that they didn't, they didn't, um, uh, they, 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 uh, the Olympics was canceled. They didn't go to South Africa and they were given a break. Um, so we think the biggest challenge for the players was the lack of training facilities. Um, if they all went back home, you know, not everyone has access to a home gym. Um, so they didn't have the weight training or you know, a field to practice on per se. Um, and as a result, we think there may have been trouble maintaining that level of peak fitness. Um, that also can translate into time being spent with families. If any of these players had young families, you're devoting more time to like childcare and any other household duties, maybe picking up slack. Um, and then on the flip side, just not knowing when things would go back to normal, the uncertainty of, you know, phasing back in. Um, so 
there's some players that would probably be comfortable traveling versus some that would be reluctant. Um, so the team dynamic could be shifted. There may be some disparity in exactly when would be the right time to hop back on the training circuit. Okay. And you're, you're completely right about the, um, the facilities because all governmental facilities were totally closed down and indeed they've been opened but only to carded athletes so the national development team cannot use the national facilities at the moment and that's really interesting because um because there is another year to develop the players four new players have moved from my five new players have moved from my squad to the senior squad but they couldn't train with them they can't train or they wouldn't so what the coaches had to do is card them so that they're allowed to train with the rest of the group and that's been fantastic for me because the, the transition has been seen and those that worked really hard during our lockdown, actually it paid off because they were able to move seamless, more seamlessly into that environment. So there's a, there's a government decision at the highest level having an impact on the athletes and, and on the squad. So they, when the carding starts up, they, could, they can't train. They couldn't, our, our athletes cannot train in those facilities. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Cameron. Um, and then the San Fr the 49ers, do you th what do you think they're, they're obviously being the athletes' key concerns are now? So from the player's perspective, we think that key concerns on moving forward now um, is like the conditioning part. Um, are you still in shape or not? Some might have had like better gear to work out than uh, someone else. So where is everyone at? And also a lot of uncertainty. Um, you start, you're going to start playing again. Like, how do the other people follow the rules? Are they as strict as you? So are they going to put you in danger or not? And what's going to happen to the season? Are you going to be able to finish it? Or is there going to be a second wave? Um, so Absolutely. how's going to season continue? Yeah, and I think the biggest question is, will Tokyo 2021 now go ahead? Yeah. Will it be behind closed doors? Will there be a vaccine? Yes. Have they given up uh, two years of their lives to go to an event which doesn't take place? So is it worth continuing? I'll, I'll share that information with you in a minute, but some, some great stuff, Simone. Thanks very much. Um, Barcelona? Yeah, so for the USA trip, we said that they should not go because right at March and April, um, most of the U.S. leagues shut down in the middle of March. Um, they also, I don't know when the travel ban happened, but they could have gotten stuck there, kind of like the first question we talked about. Um, and then also, it says low number of cases, but the cases were probably, or I know they were rising too. So. Yeah, it was when we made the decision then where we were going was low. Again, one of the issues was we was self-funded program. We hadn't taken any money from the parents and yet we paid 50% of the, the flight fees and American Airlines wouldn't refund them to us at the time because the, the flights hadn't been cancelled. Thankfully, they were then cancelled. So, and the Six Nations, end of June. So Ireland's coming out of lockdown. It's going to be in a university. Yeah, for... I mean, you guys were coming out of lockdown, but I think a lot of other places weren't. And I think the having six nations bring their teams to you is is, is a dangerous idea just because of where people are coming from. You don't know what people have been doing. So we said no to that one as well. Yeah, okay. And, and we did. And what we've done is move the tournament to the same time, exactly the same time next year. And we're going to America next year, but this time we're gonna, we're, we'll pay ourselves. Um, so yeah, you, you made the same decision, but, but we didn't have the guidance and support that, that maybe would have happened or that we weren't under the government guidelines that the senior team were. So finally, thank, thanks very much, Douglas. Uh, Celtic? Yeah, so uh, for the break in July, um, we were thinking that they should have the uh, half of the July in a break and the other half, they go back to training because, uh, yeah, so... so um, we didn't want them because July is supposed to be, be a break. So we didn't want them to cancel all their plans and everything. But obviously because of the lockdown, they would miss training. Also, they have to get in shape for next year because they missed a lot of trainings in June. So the other half would uh, be training. Okay. 
And so what we did is we stuck with our initial decision that July was going to be a protected month and we gave them July off because we were worried of the mental impact of them not seeing their friends for three or four months. We'd promised them that time. A lot of them had holidays booked. Um, so did we as, as staff and obviously my staff are volunteers. So we stuck to the word um, and therefore we gave them July off. So, so hard, you know, you, yeah. I can see why you came back to that, but, but it was also informed by what we did before. So whereas the, women, the senior women took a complete break, we actually increased to seven, eight physical sessions per week. The reason we've gone from an under 21 up to an under 23 squad is because physically the elite teams, the senior teams, of our, the, the, the conditioning levels are so high, you can't go as a 20 or 21 year old direct to that senior team. But, so our athletes are not necessarily properly conditioned. The second reason was, is we were very concerned. This is really important. Myself and the psychologist who's a volunteer and um, our conditioning coach who reads their daily month were very concerned about the vulnerability of these girls. And did they have the skills to cope? Number one, they come out of college. Number two, they had to live with their families. Number three, they couldn't visit their friends. Number four, they had to study from home and were isolated. And then we take routine away from them. So we actually made the program physically different and much bigger. And I should have mentioned that the senior team, every girl got their own weights at home. Literally, they stripped every gym they could find and gave them weights. And what skills do you think the players develop, Roland? Well, uh, we thought that we, they, they definitely develop self-regulation, like how they train, how they do everything, basically. Um, they learned or developed how to maintain a healthy uh, mental health, mostly because I think this, this time was really stressful. So, so that, that a skill they, they, yeah, they, they learned. And also um, maybe to plan in the future for uh, financial savings. Because I think that, that this, this whole lockdown and everything was so sudden and uh, also have an economical, like a big economical impact. They, yeah, they, now, now they will think of the future to have some savings up for, for stuff like this happens again. Hopefully not. But yeah. So these are the programs. The women basically took 10 weeks off and then they've gone back in June, July, August to, to around now to regional only. So people don't have to travel. They're not allowed to travel in cars um, with together. So if a, so, this is where the senior team would be restricted and the junior team isn't because that's a national guideline. What we did, we did a four phase with the under 23s. They had six or seven S and C sessions a week. We did self testing with them so they could see they were getting fitter because that then showed it was worthwhile and it was making a difference. So we did a 5K, 1K and a 16 lengths of a pitch test. We offered psychological support and our psych touch base with every player we deemed as vulnerable. Um, and I did individual meetings open. You can book one whenever you wanted about three times. Okay, so we knew who was vulnerable and we allowed them to focus on their exams. Then we did a six week team challenge. So we, the exam times are very varied, so it wasn't overly difficult, but we split them into uh, five teams for six weeks and they had different tasks. We had a quiz, they did a TikTok, they made a video as a group and we, and we had prizes and everything uh, for that, but it brought them together. Remember the importance of connection. And some of the girls were new into the group. So we gave them July off, so they're back from their time off and now we're just going into a regional phase. So. Um, that's demonstrated there. Um, the difficult thing we have for them is, well, where is the focus? Your team know they're going to the Olympics. Our girls don't, and that's our goal at the moment. This was the feedback a couple of weeks ago from the senior team about um, coming back to training. And there's some really interesting ones here because some of the teams that went back in other sports got a lot of injuries because they went back too quickly. Okay, there's people worried about travel, okay, that the standards may drop, okay. Are the Olympics themselves gonna actually take place? Okay, um, and other aspects of their life had now become a priority. 
and their plan that they, we think seven or eight girls will retire after the Olympics if it had gone ahead this year. Are they going to stay on? Will they make it? Is it worth it? Are they putting another year of their career on hold? So a whole load of uncertainty. And I think if you look at how governments have acted, for me, it's the government who've given clear, strict guidelines um, and clarity rather than and way uncertainty that helps. So how do they feel about going back to, to their national training in full, so coming together rather than regional with the seniors? There's a lot of apprehension. Three out of five are apprehensive about doing that and unsure about it. So whereas you would hope everyone would be excited. So there's real challenges there now that need to be dealt with. Um, so I'm gonna skip this part. That well, Very quickly, this is about good uh, talent development and what talent needs to develop is um, it needs setbacks. So we actually took the setbacks that COVID presented for our under 23 as something that will help them develop them. Now this is feedback, again, I, I empower my athletes, so there'll be spelling mistakes in this. So these are the things that you talked about a little bit, Roland, about uh, gyms are important, but we still adapted well. The biggest thing problem our players had was that for once in their lives, they had no routine. There wasn't school timetable. There wasn't lectures because the lectures were recorded and they didn't have a gym time. They didn't have a training time and a place to be at. And some of them really struggled with that, but most of them acknowledged it was a skill they developed. Some of them struggled to turn off. Okay, and, and, and actually found ways to take, take a break. And we talked about that. We gave them mindfulness apps and stuff, okay. Um, and for a lot of them that might have been a little bit burnt out, they, they started to really miss hockey, okay. Um, and they were, they were the fittest they've ever been at the end of those six, eight weeks. So we feel adding in and keeping the program going was the right thing to do. And that has been fed back to us time and time again, not just by them, but by their parents. Okay. Um, so th they learned loads. Yes, that's it finished. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Questions. Yeah, we're really running out of time. Um, My apologies. No, it's okay. We I enjoyed it to the fullest. Only uh, we are uh, limited to a time schedule. Um, I think we do not have sufficient time for real uh, questions. We have three minutes still to go. Um, so uh, on behalf of everyone, uh, the universities and the students, I would like to thank you a lot about uh, uh, the, the great topic that you covered with the two teams. Um, and um, I would love to have you back in Amsterdam at some stage uh, to invite you in our programs over there. Um, I hand over now to Bartle uh, because uh, he will, sorry. Can I just say, Thomas, to the, to the students, I'm on yes. WhatsApp, LinkedIn, Facebook. Please send me your questions. I have to go into lockdown myself now, self-isolation for two weeks, having been in that awful country, the Netherlands, bringing my son to college. So please contact me. I love to engage with you. Okay, great. Thank you. On behalf of all of us, thank you very much. Uh, I hand over now to Bartle. Yes, David, uh, this was spot on and actually it was the best introduction for sharing the last remarks. Um, high performance, um, all teams received their assignment, their team assignment last Thursday. Oh, great. And what is the difference between being uh, a group, being a team or being a high performance team? And I think you mentioned it beautiful. It's not only the result, it's also the journey and the will, uh, the legacy uh, you leave behind. So basically all uh, groups we will be now placed back in the breakout rooms and you can stay there for two minutes, for one minute or for five minutes. But the only thing you now dis uh, you discuss before we leave is what is it that you want to leave behind with your team? Is it only the article that you want to write or is it something else? Because the assignment you receive was quite broad, maybe even vague. And maybe you just started who's going to do what, what are the working principles? But have you discussed what happened actually during that first meeting? Who took the lead? 
uh, what happened in the last days? Have you communicated at all? Basically, you're now getting back in the breakout rooms and the only thing you discuss what or how in the next coming two days are we going to work together? And you can, uh, for example, agree on a meeting somewhere in the coming two days. But Thursday, we want to know from every team what is the direction you're going to with your team and what is it exactly you want to leave behind. And that can also mean what principles are you agreeing on, what values, what, what are the underlying principles you are agreeing on. So we're going to leave you now behind. You can stay for a couple of minutes in your breakout room just to discuss how you're going to uh, communicate in the next coming two days, but you must come together somewhere in the coming two days so that next Thursday, after the uh, session with Casimir, you're going to say to us or share to all of us what is the legacy you want to leave behind. And what does it mean also for the way you are going to cooperate? Again, David, many thanks. Um, good luck. You can stay in your breakout rooms and we will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Cheers. Yeah. I'm just telling you what's up there, Thomas. <laughs> yes. Sorry, sorry, my timing. Uh, you made us sweat, hey. <laughs> we weren't sure about your last slides. <laughs> yeah, that was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. Well, well done. Well done. It Thank was you. spot yeah. on. Yeah. Spot yeah, on. Okay. Yeah. Very less of the COVID just because of the questions that were coming in and where their interest was. I know, I know that was the topic, but I think it gave a rationale. Everything else gave a rationale to why we did what we did. Yeah, you build it up to a climax. I think it, it would be great to um, be able to talk in length with them about the implications and the, the things that you can do because they have a I'm lot of opinions. There were a, a couple of really smart questions that we couldn't touch. Uh, I'm happy to do a Q&A Zoom at some point, or, or if you want to send them to me, I do them on a slide. Yeah. Thomas, do you want to do that? And I'll just send them a document. Yeah, they'll be great. Yeah, for the group. Yeah, yeah for sure. Would that yeah, help with sure. me? And yeah, we let's, let's yeah, see how we can do this most effectively. Because yeah. there's some brilliant questions here. Fantastic yeah. questions. Yeah, we're going to hire you for two weeks program in Oregon uh, next month. So um, <laughs> we've got all the time yeah. uh, available. That's Isn't fantastic. it, Amy? Yes. <laughs> as long as the weather's better than Ireland. Well, I see Greg is enjoying some sun over there. Who's got sun? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It, you know, we spend enough time over the eight or nine months that it's raining in Oregon that uh, I try, I've basically spent as much time outside as I could the last two months. Nice. Yeah. All right. I think we're good for yeah, now. we're good for now. Um, David, it was perfect. Many yeah, thanks. It's okay. Sorry about my time. I will do that so that they I give you a call. I give you a call later on. Okay, I'm in the car in about half an hour. I'm going to see my American students from University of...